thing, but I just want to take a moment this morning to let you know how appreciate, appreciative me and Bobby are for Neil and Nan and everything they've done in our lives. It's, it's, an, it's a lot. <laughs> so, and because I'm a pastor too, I know sometimes, you know, we get familiar with each other. We meet every week and everything, but it's important to remember uh, who God has given you. And it's important to remember that across the board. You know, we are the family of God to remember each other. But I just want to take, take the time to, to just honor Neil and Nancy and thank God for them in front of you guys. Um, because I want, you know, I want to encourage you to just uh, appreciate and get the most out of what God has given you. And I know there's other great you know, men and women of God leading and helping to, to lead in this church. And, and uh, you know, Neil has such a great, and Nan too, they have a, such a great apostolic anointing on their life as well. So it's not just pastoral. The church gets all mucked up today because it, nobody teaches us the distinction much about needing all fivefold ministries. And pastors are super important, don't get me wrong, but they're just one of five. It's kind of like a fish. You know, if you just have one finger, you're in big trouble, right? <laughs> so you need them all. And uh, so, so there's also quite a, an amazing apostolic anointing and calling on this church. And of course, you see that when you're having praise and worship and you start to flow in the Spirit. You know, to me, I, I'm here as a visitor, and I see that, and I'm like, thank God for this. What a beautiful flow to feel comfortable at the throne of God and have somebody that knows how to take you there and lead you there, you know? Sometimes when we all come in, we're, we have more unbelief than we have faith. Sometimes when we all just gather together in any given church meeting anywhere, we don't realize, but we're, we actually de are dealing through a spirit of unbelief, or you could call it a spirit of anti-faith. We don't think about it because it's kind of mostly subconscious. So, But a lot of times when we come into a gathering together, we're, that's what we're trying to break through. We're just trying to get our mind off of everything that we've been a part of, distracted by in the week, and get into the presence of God. I'm going to tell you what right now. It makes a huge difference when you've got an apostolic anointing to just help you go ahead and smash right through that. And just go right in. And I see that many times when I visit here. I see many times where we come in and we're just us, and then all of a sudden Neil gets up and leads the flow, and then all the, wow, that was a great service. I felt like God spoke to me, touched me, ministered to me. Amen? So anyway, I felt like that's part of what I should say today. What an amazing time to be alive. This is an amazing, amazing time. I've said it both weeks, and kind of our theme here, I guess Ian and I were trying to come up with titles for the last two Sundays, and so our theme has kind of been, this. God, I really am missing you. God, I really have been missing you. Even though I kind of wasn't aware of it. That's kind of what we've been talking about. We used a song from the 80s, you know, where the guy said, you know, to his wife or whatever in the song, I'm not missing you at all. But it's just because he was torn between he loved his wife and he loved his career. And you know what I mean? That's just natural stuff. But because we're human, that's what happens to us. Sometimes we get so busy doing whatever we're doing in life, we forget that, you know, Sometimes we leave God out. Does anybody do that besides me? You see, and if you realized all this stuff that we've been talking about, you wouldn't do it, but the thing is we don't realize that we're doing it. Did you know that your subconscious, you know, the psychological world calls your heart the subconscious, really. And it's really just that lower part, that deep part of your mind, the makeup of your soul that God gave us that really interacts kind of like a revolving door with our spirit man. That's what, that's, that's what the heart is. That's why the Bible says over and over and over again, like you gotta, you got to do it with your heart. It can't just be something you're doing with your mind. You have to do it with your heart. In other words, you have to put your mind into it repeatedly over and over until it gets down into your heart and it becomes second nature. Did you know 95% of the decisions that me and you make are made with the subconscious or on the subconscious level, on the heart level. That's why it's such a big deal when we get to the book of Hebrews. We've been looking at Hebrews. You know, it's such a big deal. And the message is, listen, it's a tough time, but it's an important time in history. Make sure you don't turn, give into the pressure and go back. Make sure you go forward. And a big part of the teaching in this book is that the way to do that is with a heart full of faith. So it's constantly putting your heart out there for God. Are you glad you came to church this morning? That's what God is asking of us. You know, and it, sometimes it's not easy to figure out how to do that. 
You have to think about it a little bit, but that's the point. God's like, hey, hang out with me, and I'll teach you. I'll just walk you right through it. But when we're trying to do it ourselves, you're like, oh, you know, how do I get in touch with my heart? You know, and I even hear Christians say things like, you know, doesn't the Bible say the heart is, you know, wicked above all things? And I'm like, yeah, but it also says, right? That's the thing about God. He's so big, it takes more than one of us to figure him out, and then even then we can't do it. We have to back up from the forest we've been living in and look at the big picture so we can get our direction today. And part of doing that is when you back up, you're like, okay, wait a minute, God's looking for the heart. And so when he tells people in about 64 to 68 AD that, listen, you know, this is an important time not to, not to fall away, not to go back, even though persecution and pressure has increased, because the words of Jesus are about to come to pass around the area of Jerusalem and Judea, and judgment is about to come upon them, and you know, God does things in measure and increments and things like that. And so the church had been warned by the Holy Spirit to hang in there and stay steady and stay strong. But the teaching in the book is the only way to do that is with your heart. Putting your heart continuously out there for the Lord. How many people have ever discovered that when you put your heart into your Christian faith, it gets stomped on a little bit? So it may sound easy, and you're like, oh, yeah, I know how to do that. But no, I'm talking about put your heart out there for God so that when you get crushed, you know, something in you just says, you know what? Even though it's like that, even though hard times came, even though somebody did me wrong, hey, God, I just want you to know I'm still here for you. I still trust you. I still love you. Even when things didn't work out, even when prayers didn't get answered, even when I don't really understand what's going on, I got stuck somehow. Lord, I just want you to know. I'm still here for you. That's what I mean. Put your heart out there for God. Just put your heart out. Just keep putting your heart out there for God. And what happens is, over time, you're building something inside you called faith. Every time you go to God and God, you know, makes himself available or, or speaks to you or does something, you know, touches you, faith builds in your heart. And so putting yourself out there is what builds faith. Christians, because we're human, we have a tendency to want to cut and run just like everybody else, don't we? I tell you, before Trump got elected, I was thinking about, man, where, can I move to Australia? Can I move to South America? Where can I go? Because the lights were getting shut out where I live. But you know what? Most people didn't realize it. In fact, a full half of the, of the, you know, the citizenship of my country, they were just like, oh, that'd be okay. You know, just elect that other lady. You know, one that's kind of witchy and weird, strange, and does weird things, and has a crazy background. Just, oh yeah, it won't matter. Whoever's the leader will be the leader. It was getting dark, and we didn't know it. So I was glad, forget about who Trump is as an individual personality, right? I was glad that somebody came along and said, let's don't go that way quite yet. I was glad that somebody actually stood up, whether they knew what they were saying or not, I'm not sure, but somebody stood up and said, in this nation, we don't worship the government, we worship God. What is that? You see what I mean? It gave Christians an opportunity to kind of put themselves back out there. Because for the last decade, we had a recession, we had a president that was, wow, who is this guy? And people were scared to say much of anything about anything. Christians were losing their boldness. Christians may be a little too bold now because now they're falling after a man sometimes. We go to extremes. But the point of what I'm saying today is like, we have to come to grips with the fact that God is always walking us through. The key thing to keep on your heart and mind is that, hey, listen, I really do need Him. No matter if it's a good time or a bad time, I need God. So I want to do this today. We're actually going to read out of the book of Hebrews. I'm not sure we did that the last two weeks. And that could be a, that could be a bad, you know, if, if a preacher doesn't read from the Bible, that can be really bad. Somebody say amen. But sometimes when a preacher's full of the word and the word's just coming out of him, it's not always a bad thing. So give me a little slack in that area, would you? <laughs> so let's go back to the book of Hebrews and let's, you know, let's look at it again. This is a book God gave at a key point in history to keep people moving forward. And there's a lot of warnings in the book that tell you how, you know, how to make sure you, you stay on track. And, but there's a lot of encouragement in the book about how to let God walk you through things. And so we obviously, in, in three Sundays, we can't even touch it. But 
Let's just go to a, a chapter here that will help highlight some of these things. Chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, I, I went down to Kurong and got myself a modern amplified version Bible. And it's not a commercial for this because I haven't really checked it out closely yet. I, I kind of like the amplified Bible. So I'll be reading from that today. Now, I want to, uh, I want to start in verse 19, verse 18. Now, if you're reading through the book of Hebrews, just to bring you up to this point, you realize in the first chapter, he starts to make the case for how great the Lord is. Hebrews starts with God. It doesn't start with Paul or James or John. We talked about that. It starts with God. And it highlights that God in these last days has done something so different. It's a different day, and God's doing something different. And God himself is the messenger. God sent himself. From a human standpoint, we're like, how is that even possible? But God highlights the fact that I'm God, and it is possible with me. And it's like God took his heart out. Jesus said, I'm in the bosom of the Father. Remember that in the book of John. It's like God somehow took his heart out and gave us his son. And gave us his heart. And so, you know, when you get to the Trinity, it's like God has this multifaceted ability to distribute himself. And Hebrews starts out like this. Keep your eyes on God. And then chapter 2 says, because God is so great, you understand that the plan God has for me and you is so great. And he sent his son for us. He took upon himself the likeness of human flesh for us. Wave your hand if you know Jesus did that for you. You know why he did it? Obviously, he did it to pay the price for the sin of the world and the sins, plural, that you and I would commit. He did it. He actually nailed us to the cross with him, so he took us there with him so that he could totally identify with us and we could totally identify with him and so that he could release the resurrection power of God upon us when he rose from the dead and introduce us into the kingdom of God to not walk in it later, to walk in that now. Hello? Hello? Now, we still live here, so this is not like to hyper-spiritualize it. I'm just saying that even though we're right here in Kiwana or whatever, we're in the kingdom. And the Bible says in chapter 2, the plan of God is so great, Jesus had to take a body upon himself so he could become, listen to this, a great high priest of the highest order. So a lot of times when we think about what the purpose of God is for us and sending Jesus, we think about, yeah, he went to the cross and that is super important. Not minimizing that, but have you thought lately about what Jesus is doing for you now? You see, because if you do, it'll help you remember that I have a current relationship with him. Jesus is a high priest, and it talks about in the chapters in between, after the order of Melchizedek, and that kind of throws us for a loop today. We're like, what in the world is he talking about? Well, it's showing us that this whole book is being based on Psalm 110. Again, more than we can go into. But you go back to Psalm 110, kind of freaked the Jewish people out because David saw a vision, evidently, of God sitting on the throne and God the Son there at His right hand. And so their belief was God is one God, you know, and they were strong in that, but somehow God was here in this vision of David. God was in uh, multiplying Himself somehow. And so Hebrews brings us back to that and brings us back to the bigness of God, the greatness of God, but also in Psalm 110, it says he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. He's seated at the right hand of God where he's waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. So Hebrews starts to talk about how great the plan of God is. See, make sure you don't get involved in your own plan in life. Make sure you stay hooked up to the plan of God. It'd be very helpful. Now, don't just let me come here and preach to you for three weeks and then forget about Hebrews. It'd be helpful to you if you went out of here for about, say, the next month or two and just maybe read Hebrews, looked into it deeply, studied it, you know, put it in your subconscious. You know what I mean? Don't just, don't just you know, read a few devotional verses every morning. Like, pour yourself into it because what it'll do is help make you the person God's called you to be in this important hour in time. It'll help that. And I think that's what God brought it up and brought out. So, so God is highlighting a, a, a changing of the guard in Psalm 110, and Hebrews picks up that thought. Remember we talked about the tabernacle of David? How that in the last days, God said, I'll restore the tabernacle of David. Well, the tabernacle of David was the heart taken out of the tabernacle of Moses in that in-between special time before the, the, the temple was being built, the first temple, the Solomon's glorious temple was being built. 
And so God says, God doesn't say we're going to go back and resurrect the temple of Solomon. God says, in the last days, we're going to raise up the tabernacle of David because in the tabernacle of David, it was all about God. It was David the king, the priest, the prophet. David, also a multiple anointed person who could do multiple things because he's serving a God that can do multiple things. It's all this is a picture for us. What we're doing these three weeks is painting a picture. Any painters in the house? Any artists? Yeah, like to paint a little bit. Yeah, at least one. Yeah, big smile on your face. You like painting, don't you? Well, when you paint, you know, the lady in the back could tell you, you know, it's important just not what you paint, but what you paint on. The background's important. The canvas is important, right? The colors you use are important. The kind of lighting that you use and the skills that you have, all those things are important. What God is doing a lot of times is painting a picture. He's not expecting us to know every detail of the doctrine. He wants us to get back out of the forest and just look at the picture every so often. And then you know what happens when you look at the picture, then you're like, oh, now, now I understand a little bit more about what that teaching means. That's what the Bible's like. Picture's worth a thousand words. God's like, listen, He's li listening is important. Looking also into these things is important. So know today, remember today, you have a great high priest, Jesus. Yes, the same Jesus who walked on the earth in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for three plus years. But Paul said, we don't even know Jesus the same way, just some years after his resurrection, we don't know him in the flesh like they once knew him. We know him in the spirit, and it's important that we know each other the same way. You want to know why the church lags behind and is so much like the world? Because we forget we have a great high priest. We read it, and we're like, oh, that's great, you know, but it's like, it's like a story to us or something. It's not a story. The reason Neil can come up and just lead us into the flow with Jody and these guys worshiping God, you know, we can just get into a place where God starts talking to you. Did God start talking to anybody besides me today? Right? When you get in that, what happens is you get in touch with God. So it's so important sometimes to have somebody help you get a little jump start, isn't it? We got in that today, and I, you know what I started seeing? Neil was talking about the fire of God, and I started, I started seeing fire, and I started remembering how, you know, fire is a weird thing. It, it can burn some things completely up. Those are the things that are burnable. But there's some things that are not burnable. I don't know if burnable is a word or not, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it is right now. And those things, it tends to enhance and steal and make stronger. That's why on the day of Pentecost, man, they hear a rushing mighty wind. The next thing they know, they all got fire on them, but nobody's getting burned up. They're like the boys in the fiery furnace. They're in the fire, but they don't smell of fire. It's like Paul taught later, you know, we can build our lives either on the things that can be burned up or we can build our lives on the things that can't be burned up. But it's super important because we're going to get the fire. We're going to get the fire in this life. We're going to get the fire of God if we're walking with God. You cannot afford as a Christian today just walk around and know Jesus in the flesh out of the four Gospels, for example. Now, I love the four Gospels. I love the words in red for in particular. I love those are important words. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is you have to follow on to know the Lord. That, that's what God's asking of us today. Bobby brought up a word last week. Uh, she gave a word. She came up here before, uh, before, um, before I came to preach, and she gave a word. And she didn't know I was going to preach last week on the sons of Zadok, right? You know, Melchizedek means, you know, king of righteousness. It's two words, Malki and Zadok. Zadok means righteousness. And there's a real depth to that. You know what I mean? God's always been God. And God's always had people that were uh, people that he dealt with, spoke to, and used to reach other people. And so Melchizedek is this ultimate, like, not quite completely human guy, maybe, representing righteousness. But then when you follow that kind of thinking throughout the Bible, you realize God always had these kind of people throughout the Old Testament. He had these guys called the sons of Zadok that were priests. And when you get to Ezekiel, he says, listen, the priest from the days of Eli, which was what the word Bobby was giving last week, they were not able to continue on because when Israel fell, when Israel got scared, wanted to turn and go back, and Hebrews talks about this in depth, when they wanted to go back, some of these priests fell off and, and kind of were like Aaron, you know, when Moses was on Sinai, kind of gave the people what they wanted. But the sons of Zadok, or righteousness, like Melchizedek, 
They were there again at these key points in the Bible. They were there. What has God made us in Christ? The righteousness of God. You are the righteousness. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it's so important, you know, that we act like this is true. The sons of Zadok were these people that when everybody else turned back, even the priests, they stood forth. And you know what God said about them? In Ezekiel 44, he said, I want those people ministering to me. The other guys can't minister to me. They can minister to the house and do things and whatever, move chairs and stuff like that. But the sons of Zadok only are the ones I will allow to come and minister to me. And so fast forward in the New Testament, okay, who are we? We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're naturally those kind of people. But you look around the church and you're like, but where are they? We seem like we have mostly Christians today that just minister about the house, but they forgot about ministering to God. I want to be somebody that ministers to God. I think that's what the word that Bobby was sharing last week was meant to highlight for us, you know. I didn't preach about Zadok at all last week, so it was good we had the word. Are you here today? So, Paul comes up through, and we're, remember, we're working our way up here to Hebrews 10, because I've just got a couple minutes left. <laughs> And Paul gets stuck in the teaching. He's teaching these amazing things. God is great and better. God's plan is great and better. Chapters 1, chapter 2. Chapter 3, the call of God is better, is greater, all right? Because of Jesus, our calling. This is what it's about. The call of God on our life is so much greater. Chapter 4, make sure you work hard to enter into the rest. Don't just go do something for God. Enter into God and let God do it through you. And then as he goes through five, six, seven, he gets stuck. And he says, I'd like to talk to you more about this, but I can't because you guys aren't listening. And he said, it's not because you have chosen really not to listen. It's just because in your, in your walking with God as Christians up to this point, you've gotten sidetracked and your heart's not in the right place. You don't have ears to hear on a heart level. And it's caused you not to be able to be trained to know God. That's Hebrew, the, the just chapter 5, the very end. So then chapter 6 says, so make sure let's get a solid foundation. Basically, let me paraphrase, it says, so we can go forward. So at the end of chapter 5 and the beginning of chapter 6 is a really important part of Hebrews. You might want to make a note of that, okay? Because when you get to Hebrews 6, 3, the writer says straightforward, if, you don't, if you're not able to go forward, it's because God actually might be blocking you. It's because maybe you're, 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 you know about God, but maybe you stopped walking with God. Maybe you don't know that Jesus every day wants to talk to you and has invited you to the throne to come boldly, to come and talk to him and interact with him because he's administrating all things that are God from the right hand of God, just like Psalm 110 said he would thousands of years ago. He's doing that today, but you and I are called to just come right in there, minister to God, talk to God, get instruction from God, go do things for God. But see, if we leave out this important part of actually coming, we can't do any of the rest. So the will of God becomes super important in the Bible. So when you get to Hebrews 10, kind of keep that in mind. It says here in verse 18, Now, where there is absolute forgiveness and complete cancellation of the penalty of these things, he's talking about these sins, now, I like the Amplified there, don't you? I like words like absolute and complete. Absolute forgiveness and complete cancellation is what Jesus did for me and you. Where there are these things, there is no longer any offering to be made to atone for sin. So we don't need to go backward and go under the law. Today, we don't even need to go backward and become like the early church necessarily because we should have been going through a growth process all these 2,000 years. Amen? Amen? So if you just go back and do what the early church did, that's not even enough. So he's like, don't go back. Don't go back. Jesus did everything. Don't go back. Therefore, believers, since we have confidence, full freedom, and full freedom to enter the holy place, the place where God dwells by means of the blood of Jesus. Bobby was just talking about that. Since we have this confidence and full freedom by this new and living way, verse 20, which he initiated and opened to us through the veil, that is through his flesh. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, what happened to the veil? <sighs> Top to bottom, four inches thick, boom, gone. Open. The way is new and living and open. 
And there's no reason you and I don't just keep going right through it all the time. And again, this isn't hyper-spirituality. This is just fact. This is just basic Christianity 101. We're supposed to be living a, living a completely naturally supernatural lifestyle. Hello. And see, sometimes at the church, like, oh, I'm not sure about it. That. That's because you've let that spirit of unbelief get around your life. Just identify that when you see it and say, no, I choose to believe. Lord, I'm going to trust you. You did do that. The Bible says you did it. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to trust in it. And since we have a great and wonderful priest, verse 21, who rules over the house of God, who's he rule over? Me and you. The church is really big. It's in heaven and it's in earth, and Jesus is ruling over all of it. Let us, here's a key phrase you'll find in Hebrews 13 times, let us. See, it's not something you do alone, it's something we do together. I've mentioned that, I think, each week. If you do it alone, you're not going to get very far. If we do it together, you may be shocked at how far we go. And that's part of what Hebrews is saying. Don't go back, just go forward together. Don't go back and fall away one by one by one like lots of ministers are doing today. You know, lots of ministers are going back to the Catholic faith, for example. Going back to denominationalism, for example. Going back to anything to run to anything that makes them feel more secure because a lot of people today feel like, I don't know if we're getting anything done because they haven't stepped out of the forest and looked at the big picture lately. You step out and you look at the big picture, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're serving God here. You know what I mean? We're worshiping God at church. Oh, why do we go to church? Well, Hebrews 10 is going to tell us here in a minute. You know, like it's really important just to get together like coals in a fire. Just get them together. You know, if you don't have a fire, get the coals gathered up. Man, I feel dry lately. I'm not sure what to do. I just feel like, man, I don't know what God called me to do. You need to get around other coals. Hello? You've got to get other coals because even though you only have a little heat and they only have a little heat, you get that heat together and it's at least twice, it's probably ten times more heat. You get a whole little little briquettes together right in your, in your fireplace or in your uh, cooker there, your grill. All of a sudden, pff, fire, whoa. You're like a man now, I made fire. <laughs> See, God, I really have been missing you, God. I really have been missing you. I didn't realize it. We may need to come back and just consider these things. Jesus is not far away. Jesus is up close and personal. In fact, Ephesians says we are seated with him in heavenly places. We are not who we used to be. We used to live in the world like everybody else and do all the things the world does, and we're still human. We make mistakes. But you know what? We have a place to go when we make mistakes now. We don't go, God, what do I do? We go, God, I remember what you did. Thank you. The way was made open. It's not dependent on me. It's totally dependent on you. You start living like that, and that's what Bobby was saying. You start living like that, man, everything changes. Let us approach God with a true and sincere heart and unqualified assurance of faith, having had our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is reliable and trustworthy and faithful to his word. And the third time now it says, And let us consider thoughtfully how we may encourage one another to love and to good deeds, not forsaking the meeting together as believers in worship and instruction as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another and all the more faithfully as you see the day of Christ's return approaching. Wow. And then verse, the, the verse that follows here, verse 26, is one of those that will just put you on your head if you're not careful. For if we sin willfully, did you see that one? If we go on willfully and deliberately sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice to atone for our sins. There's no further offering to anticipate. What's he talking about? He says, listen, you could reach the point of no return if you decide not to go forward. If you just keep going back and back and back and back. I mean, God is merciful. We all know that. Wave your hand, right? God's merciful. God's full of grace. God doesn't want this for any of us. That's why God did everything to make sure that we had every chance not to go that route. But here in 2019, it's easy if we're not careful 
to just thinking, I don't know where God is. Let's go back. Yes, you know where God is. You have a Bible. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. You're there with Him, boldly coming to obtain mercy and grace to help you anytime you have need. What do you do about it? How? What is it we're supposed to do? Keep getting together. That's the sin He's talking about. Do not willfully just do whatever you want. Because if you do, you're going to more quickly go down the road backward towards a point of no return. Anybody see this in the Bible? Sometimes when Christians are like weird, like don't tell us anything harsh, negative, or, or strong. I'm like, are you kidding me? You need the fire. Let the fire get around you and challenge you and heat you up a little bit, right? And move the thinking around in your heart and in your mind shift some things out, you know, where you haven't been believing and shift some faith in that says, wow, I don't know. I don't even know if it's me. It doesn't feel like me, but somehow I just believe. I love that, don't you? Don't you love that spirit of faith? Don't you love that gift of the Holy Ghost called faith that comes on you sometimes? And you didn't even do anything. All you did is just keep doing the things you've been doing, supposed to have been doing. I remember last week I said, just be yourself. Hebrews obliterates religion, just wipes it out and says, we're not doing that anymore. Don't worry about the law of Moses and all that stuff. Doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean the commands, the moral commands and all that are not important. They're very important to make society work. But we're not doing that. We're doing something much greater. Who wants to stay stuck in Sinai, man? You're in Mount Zion. Remember when Paul writes, I think, it, I forget which book it is, Galatians, I think he says, he says, the Jewish people that are still living like that, they're actually living in Mount Sinai. That's what he says. They don't realize it. They had physically moved to Mount Zion hundreds of years before, but they're actually really spiritually living on Mount Sinai. In the New Testament, he's like, come on to Mount Zion. David paid the price to defeat the Jebusites. Nobody could beat them. It was the stronghold, the rock in the area of Jerusalem. He went right in threw them out when he became king in Jerusalem and put his house and God's house there. That's what we need today. This house is my house. I come to church, I'm like, I'm in my house, right? That's why we're family. This is my house where I live. I live with you guys, right? We're in this together. We're not running alone. We're going somewhere in God. This stuff is super important. So many things we could say, and I know I'm out of time. Jesus, when he came, he pointed out, but he did it in parables, so sometimes we don't see it directly. But one of the things Jesus pointed out was that they were on a time frame. They had been like on a, what do you call it? Like, you know, like uh, when, when you see a line go off into the horizon, you know, it gets, it gets smaller as it goes. So it's kind of a narrowing effect. As you're going down the road, it narrows to the point on the horizon. Jesus, when he came, he told them why he came, but to them it seemed like we don't understand what he's talking about. They couldn't quite get their head around him, but what they needed was to get their heart wrapped around him. So if they had been in the word, and this is what Jesus said, if you knew my father, you'd know me. If you've been in the word and like if you've been walking with God and you know, not being not being religious, even for those guys in that era, not really being religious, just being real. Just kind of being aware of the reality that you really are the chosen people. God really is setting you aside. God really has kept a lot of promises in the past, starting with Abraham for you. And you're somebody special. They needed to keep that in mind. And in keeping that in mind, they need to take the responsibility of that. And when Jesus came, he kind of showed them that like, you've been on this time scale. It was wider back there, but right now it is super narrow. Because the Messiah that's been being prophesied is now here. And now instead of hundreds of years or, or whatever, you only have three years, tops. You only have a little time to get this, man. I'm here. God's done what he said that he would do. And so it's important that you get it. Open your heart. Jesus said, really, a lot of the sins from the past would be held accountable in that day, in that generation. Isn't that weird? It's because they're in the scale. They're coming, and as they get closer to the end, it gets more and more and more fiery, more and more and more important. So the point is, if that happened at the first coming of Jesus, isn't that same thing happening now? 
as we're coming to the second coming of Jesus, to the return of Jesus, isn't the same thing happening? We're on this sliding scale type thing where, and I'm, I'm not trying to scare you that you're not saved. What I'm saying is take your salvation seriously. That's all. Like, you know, get that second win. You know what I'm saying? Like when you jog, which I do a little bit of, not as much as I used to. And the second win takes a lot longer now, I notice, at my age. But there's a thing called a second win, right? You're jogging and you hate every minute of it. I hate this. I hate this. I'm working out. I hate it. Oh, God, why do I work out? Anybody ever been there? <laughs> yeah, some people just said, I'm not doing that at all. I, that's the same feeling. I don't want to do this. But when you're running, if you just keep pressing forward, don't get scared and go back. Right? Sometimes to keep going, I'm just, I'm barely moving. <laughs> I can walk faster but I'm still jogging because I'm telling myself, okay, I got to get to this point or whatever, you know, that I've, that I've uh, gauged myself to get to. But I notice that as you're doing it, as you push and push, suddenly there's something in you, something about the way biologically we're made where you get a second win and you just go, ah, oh, I feel better now. Then you're like, yeah, got it again. I can do this. I can jog. I can still jog. Bobby and I do different kinds of exercise, you know? She, I do this kind, and she does another kind. She's like, I'm not doing that kind. I'm like, why don't we, why don't we run together? No. <laughs> She's like, why don't you do Tai Bo together with me? And I'm like, no. Because I tried that once, and you know, I was totally exhausted, like two minutes. But that's what it's like today. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, just look, just keep jogging. Even if you just have to just barely, do, just keep moving forward. Keep gathering together wherever God is. Keep getting around people of God. It doesn't matter if you agree with everything a believer thinks. You've got to get past that. Jesus will sort all that out at the throne. Just, just get together and be like, hey, you love Jesus? You're saved? Yeah, yeah, I love Jesus. I'm saved. Yeah, let's try to work together and get some other people saved. You know, and I'll close with this. Too. What, what do you call those pictures? What do you call those pictures that you look at on the wall, and then the longer you look at them, you know, something comes out of them? Whatever. You know what I mean? Our kids, they were popular in the 90s. Our kids had them, you know, and we would sit there as parents just like. <laughs> so there's a picture in a picture, but you can't see it just with your mind. Something has to happen. You have to be looking and looking and looking, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, Bam! That's like a second wind. It just comes out. And once you see it, you got it. Once I saw it the first time, then I could go back by that picture and I would walk through the house and I'd just be like, bam, got it. Right? See how fast I could do it now. Bobby pulled a picture out the other day and, and it, it was plates upside down. And she goes, do you see plates upside down? I said, that's all I see. She goes, do you see any plate that's not upside down? And I'm like, Bobby, what's the point? <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I didn't want to do it. You know, she's like, just keep looking. So I'm looking, looking. Every plate looks upside down to me. Wave your hand if you've seen this picture. And so I couldn't get it, and I couldn't get it, and I couldn't get it. And I was looking, because I was looking with my mind only, you know, conscious mind. And sometimes you just have to relax. To walk with God, it's like this. you just have to relax, take a deep breath, say, Lord, I still trust you. I don't know why I can't get it, Lord, but some other people got it, but I can't get it, but I trust you. And Bobby came over like this. She's like, here. She's like, look. She says, see this one right here? I said, yeah, it still look like an upside down plate. She said, see how the lighting's coming on this one from a different angle? She said, and as soon as she said lighting, my, something inside me went click. I looked for lighting and I saw it and all the plates turned right side up. And then I was trying to get them to go upside down again. I could, you know, it's like, it's an ongoing thing. It's like, you, you never really arrive. <laughs> you don't ever really arrive. Monet and Picasso were two contemporary artists. Picasso painted from the dark side. He saw things in an abstract way, and he would paint a person and make them look weird like that. And a lot of people said, we don't like Picasso. Bobby and I have a friend that has a, an original Picasso. And really, he's weird. But Monet, his friend, <laughs> his lifestyle was kind of crazy. I think that's why he was so dark. Monet, his friend, he, he saw the light in the morning and at night on things. He would see how the light changes what we're seeing. The bush out there looks different in the morning and at night than it looks in the middle of the day. And he saw that and he sought to reproduce that in painting. And I like to think of those two guys, you know. 
That's why there's a little bit of a process. You've got to spend some time with God. Spend some time in the Word. Spend some time in prayer. Apply God's Word to your life, even when it doesn't seem that way or feel like that. And somewhere along the line, the plates will flip. The shadows will make sense. It's the light that makes the difference. Amen? Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord, for the opportunity to just come and think differently. Father, we thank you. All the teachings that we've received, Lord God, all the years that we've been saved, God. There have been so many good things, but it's hard to contain them all. But Lord, there's been a lot of good things. But I, I thank you for that perception reality teaching, Lord. Show us how you see that. Let us perceive, Lord, through the light of God. Not the light of the world, not the light of false spirits, false teachers, prophets, apostles, all those things. Lord, let us see your light. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Let us remember. I never got down to it, but the verse what I was heading for was, remember the early days. Go back and remember them. Use them. You know, you don't have to live in them, but use them as a help to remind you what you're supposed to be doing and seeing today. Remember, the writer said, when they made fun of you, when they persecuted you. But remember how God came through. Remember what God did. Don't shrink back, the end of this chapter says, but just go forward. And that's what I pray over you today. Go forward. If you get anything out of these three services, go forward in God. Don't let loose of what you already have, what you have obtained in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Listen, if there's anybody in here this morning that has any blockages in your life, we prayed over that last week, but I don't want you to come forward. I just want, I don't want you to think about this. If there's any blockages in your life, make sure that it's not God blocking you or it's not you blocking yourself. Make sure you're not holding unbelief in your heart. Make sure you're not holding unforgiveness against another person. Make sure you're not being prayerless in your life and not giving God an opportunity to work with your heart. Give God an opportunity today. No matter what it is, say, Lord, I give my heart to you. Particularly, I want, I want you to think about, is there anybody that you have anything against that maybe just kind of pops out to you right now? If you're holding anything against anyone, I want to challenge you. Release them right now and let it go. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I just sense today, for some people, that'll be the thing that releases other things of God to come to you. Release them. Father, I forgive them. I let them go. No matter what they said, no matter what they did, Lord, I release them and give them back to you. I ask you to bless them and help them. And God, let, let the heavens remain open over me. In Jesus' name. Pastor Neal. Amen. God is good. Do you believe God is good? Rocky, I want you to, um, and Bobby, to pray for as many people as want to be prayed for this morning. Anybody here need your plates flipped? <laughs> hey, Bobby's a good flipper. Anybody need, but you see, you get the light on it. Get the light on it. It gets it flipped. Amen. So if there's anybody here today that, you know, just the goodness of God get around your life. You need your plates flipped or whatever it is. I need a lot of things flipped. But I really appreciate Bobby and Rocky. They've got a gift on their lives. And it's that mantle that's on them that can help us to break through. I believe in responding to God and allowing His servants to help break things from my life. I remember in the early days when I first got saved and we were in a charismatic move and some, some Sundays I would be on five altar calls on the one meeting. I'd just get back to my seat and they'd say something else and I'd go, oh my God, that's me. And I'd be back again and I, five, but I don't know about you, but God had a lot of work to do on my life. I was a mess. and. Uh, but I, there were people there that prayed over me. 
I had Derek Prince, the, the, the demon deliverer, and he was there. And he made an altar call, everybody that had a demon come out, so I went out. And he said to me, he said, what have you got? I said, I don't know. He said, what are you doing out here? I said, I just come for a checkup. <laughs> I don't know how transparent, how open you can be, but if you're open, God sort of sees it. I didn't want a devil. He did a shunder a Monday over me and told me to leave, and me and the devil went back to the seat. <laughs> but people pray for you and minister to you, and because that's that's their heart. I want to see you free. I want to be free. I want to be able to be free for God to be able to flow through me. Flow through me. Might need a bit of WD-40. <laughs> That's all you might need. I pulled my old push bike out the other day and racked, whacked a bit of WD-40 on her and away I went. <laughs> Not far. <laughs> I had a little go. Anybody need your plates flipped? Just come and we're going to sing about God's goodness right now and because God is good to you. We're just going to open this altar. You just want God to touch you. Let's stand to our feet today as we close this meeting. Father, we thank you. Thank you for Rocky and Bobby. Thank you for the gift that's on his life. We're here in your presence, my God. We just want you. And today, you might be able to just release us even more whether we want WD-40 or plates flipped or what, but we just want you. We're just opening ourselves up to you. And just as we sing the song, I'd love you just to come and just allow them to minister to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. I love you, Jesus. All my days. On, I've been in. held Bobby. in your hands From the moment I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Sing of his goodness Cause all my life you have been faithful Lord. All my so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God You know, you know, you know Some of you sitting back there, you know You need a bit of WD-40 <laughs> Spiritual anointing Holy Ghost oil, just to free you, to loosen you. You know that things have caused you to tighten up. You know, sometimes that tightening even causes us to become judgmental, hard. Sometimes it's very, very hard for God to be able to penetrate. But I want to tell you, He's got the goods. He's cracked harder nuts than you. He's touched harder people. I'm not saying that you like that, but circumstances, situations have caused this thing. Take advantage. Take advantage. Be honest and real to yourself. Do I need that? Why don't you just ask yourself that question right now? Do I really need that? Do I need that? I'm not trying to be religious. I'm not trying to force something on you, but you say, do I need that? Let God talk to you. If he talks to you, just come. Stand out here. We've got plenty of time. Amen. I love your voice. No, you love him. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, the goodness of 
God. Amen. The goodness of God. Beyond the goodness of God. We have been Of the goodness. 